Okay, Fabio Campanella, congrats on the new office. I don't even know if you want to talk about the new office. I'd but rather not. And yeah, but you're now, I was, we were just saying, you're a master of construction now, of yeah. commercial real estate. This is, these are all skills that you didn't know you were going to have, and now you're a master. And you just talked to me about cactuses in your office, and now you're a plant cactus, master I know, too. I know that Bring I, the mic nice and close to you. I know that I can't kill cactus, so that's the only reason I have them in the office. But you said you hired someone to come and water them. That's how much I know about, uh, about <laughs> plants. I hired somebody to come in and tell me what plants I'm not going to kill. <laughs> We, and you know, I shouldn't laugh. We have someone I, who actually, comes actually, in. Should I be putting this on? I don't oh, know where oh. you got this gold chain, but uh, <laughs> he gave it to me. He's it, like, you're Italian. You have to be wearing. Yeah, gold I, well, chain. I can see you have your. Is that a Rolex on your wrist? It's fake. No, it's it's probably not. So you're checking yeah. all the boxes. Put on the gold chain. Have yeah, yeah. a Rolex, and we'll talk insurance. Exactly. How's that? Well, not insurance. Sure. That, sure. We were just talking about this. Yeah, if yeah. You're just if you. This is the first time you've heard Fabio Campanella. What you should understand is the feedback that we get from him is really unique. That he's not an insurance guy. He's not like a financial planner guy. He is someone who can look at uh, a person's whole life in a short term with their short term objectives and their long term goals and map out how to best achieve them. And that might be talking about real estate, it might be talking about life insurance, it might be talking about what what else? Stock, like equity. Yeah, yeah. And so it's gonna be, it could be any asset class, really, I'm gonna touch upon, but um, let's call it by trade, by profession, I would be an accountant, a tax accountant, an investment advisor, and a life insurance advisor. Those are the three buckets. Yeah, you're really unique in that way. From your experience, because I know your parents were in this for both parents, correct? Well, my mom was a lawyer. Yeah. My dad was a CPA. Okay. So you've been exposed to people managing money and kind of trying to, you know, hold on to their net worth and build on it for many years. Is there a commonality you've seen? I haven't prepared you for this no worries. In, in their personalities or the way they look at life or the way they handle things that you're always kind of amazed by? Is there, is there something that you're like, oh shit, the, the people who are able to create some wealth and hold on to it are typically like this? Yeah. There, there, there are a number of commonalities that, that I see. So anecdotally, I haven't done any studies. Sure, yeah, this, what but, are they? But anecdotally, um, uh, a couple of the, the things that I see are, one, they associate themselves with other people who are like-minded yeah. and who want that makes to build sense. wealth. Yeah. That, that's the number mm-hmm. one thing. Mm-hmm. So if you, I mean, to put it um, eloquently, the way my father used to put it, if you hang out with losers, you're going to be a loser. Right. It's so funny. That word losers is the ultimate insult to me. You know, in yeah. today's world where you can't call anyone anything without getting trouble. Yeah. The word loser, I think, is still allowed. And to me, it's the worst. Like if I call somebody a loser, I feel like that is the worst thing I can call someone. I don't know why. Well, OK, so this is maybe the negative connotation is you tried and you lost. To me, you're still a winner because you tried. Right. Yeah. Okay. I guess with that, with that context, I I'm looking at when I call somebody a loser, which is very rare because to me it's serious. It means that they are just not a good person. Yeah. 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 Well, okay. You don't have your priorities straight, right? Yeah. So the, you know, a, it's the, the people you associate with. That's one thing that I see in my practice, the people who, you know, I get all kinds of people in my practice. Um, for the most part though, they are self-made. So they're, they're, Usually it's, you know, I don't have any, I don't deal with billionaires, I, but I deal with a crap ton of multimillionaires. And for the most part, they're self-made. Um, they have not inherited the money, okay? Maybe they inherited something mm-hmm. or they were given a little boost from their parents, but for the most part, they're self-made. In all different industries? A- any industry, okay? And the commonality, the commonality I see with these people is A, they want to associate themselves with other people who are going to improve them, okay? Um, B, they have a lot of grit. They're willing to stick through something, okay? C, they have patience. They're very patient. And this this could be from any, any walk of life. Um, just a doctor, for example, makes a good living. It takes patience to become a doctor. You're not just going to do a, a, a three-year college diploma and you're out there doing surgery. So they're playing the long game. Playing the long game. Um, I have a lot of very, very, very wealthy people who became wealthy with real estate, um, commercial real estate, residential real estate, and everybody who made it there played the long game. Even if they were flipping homes, they played the long game. They chipped away at it, you know, chip away, chip away, chip away. And they were interested in money. 
if you're not interested in money, I find that it's very difficult to uh, uh, amass um, a good amount of wealth. If you're, you have to be interested in money. You're interested in, in seeing the bank account grow. You're interested in seeing the net worth grow. These are the yeah, things I, that I see. That last one, yeah, I agree with you. have to be. In, it's weird because you have to be interested in money. I feel, but if your primary driver in life, and I'm sure we both know these people, is just money, I feel it's not a satisfying life. So you can be interested in money. But serve people through your business, through flipping homes, for, through being a doctor, as you describe. But I find that people who are solely interested in just the bank account number growing or just the money growing don't have a fulfilling life. So I find that the people that have some net worth that I really respect the most are doing all the things exactly as you describe. Like I agree, bang on, like on all four of those points. And they're living life in a way of serving others. And that seems to give them purpose and fulfillment versus just growing the bank account. Those people, I find something in their life usually snaps, you know, whether or they're just, just miserable people Yeah, because <laughs> they're searching, they, 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 you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. They feel that money, money doesn't buy happiness, it really but doesn't. it really does alleviate misery. Mm -hmm. it, it really alleviates misery, okay? Because when you're when you can't afford to put food on the table, when you can't afford when your kid wants to go to university and you can't afford to help them out, when you want to make a difference in life uh, or or in the world, I, I tell this to my clients all the time. It's like, listen, don't worry about charity or, or helping others right now. Your house isn't in order yet, mm -hmm. right? You're going to be save able to yourself first, save yourself first. It's the same thing. You know, you're on a plane. They, they tell you to put the oxygen mask on yourself before you put it on the kid, because if you can't breathe, you're not putting it on anybody. Right. You can make a much bigger difference with 10 million bucks in your bank account than you can make with 10 million dollars of, of debt. You know what I'm saying? So help yourself first, establish yourself. Then when you're established, you can help other people. So coming back full circle, you know, money isn't going to directly buy you happiness, but it's certainly going to alleviate misery and it's going to buy you the ability to have influence. Right. Mm, yeah. So money is, in my opinion, it's an important thing. Obviously I deal with money every day and when you're dealing with money uh, and when you're dealing with people's money, not institutions money, you know, I left uh, institutions back in 2000. 10. Mm -hmm. That's right. I always right? forget about that. Yeah. yeah. I left, I left the institutional world, world uh, in 2010 and I went to the individual world. I went to what, what we call in the investment advisory uh, industry retail. Right. And I started dealing with people. And when you're dealing with people's money, you are inadvertently dealing with all aspects of their life. You know? We came to realize that in this business. Yeah. All aspects. Yeah. You know, so yeah. I, you know, especially when you're dealing with people's individual money, not just one asset class, you know, when I'm, if I'm doing, sure. I have many, many, many uh, clients where I'm doing everything. I'm advising on their estate. I'm advi I'm their investment advisor. I have custody of their assets. I, I'm their accountant. I'm kind of doing everything for yeah. them. Right. And uh, as they age, you know, they're communicating with you on many different things because the flow of money in your life is going to affect all these different things, right? To the point where I, I have multiple final text messages from people mm -hmm. like on you're their in deathbed. Their, and you're in their will. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm literally the advisor on their, on their, on their will and the advisor to their, mm -hmm. to the estate trustee. Makes right? sense. So, you know, how many clients have I, you know, it sounds morbid, but how many clients have I visited in the hospital literally on their deathbed to help coordinate things because they they need the help right oh or they god so it's just uh it's one of those things where being involved with people and being involved with people's money it allows you it to sort of get into their lives get into their family life and you learn a lot you learn a lot about like patterns of human behavior family relationships family relationships um secrets that people keep from oh each other god, it's you're crazy right. yeah Holy shit, Fab. I never really thought all your, and you take this stuff. So I, what I admire about you is like, we, you know, when I see you, you're lighthearted and we joke around, but you're, you're, you deal with a lot of serious matters clearly. Um, and then you always have to be learning too, because the landscape's change. I do want to talk to you about some, you know, financial yeah. planning and some real estate, but I'm just thinking about this, like today's economy 
is so wild to me because I started really deeply digging into the economy in 2008 during that financial crisis that caught me off guard. Like our family almost lost everything in the 1990s in real estate. And then when 2008 hit and we didn't know how impacted Canada would be, I thought, oh my God, here we go again. And I still, even though I'm in real estate, I still don't know anything about how the greater economy works. And that started my deep dive into the economy. And now I feel like the economy is in a state with the amount of that you know some of the demographic influences some of the influences of technology some of the influences of a, a debt-based system reaching a huge debt to gdp number like there's all these huge kind of macro factors that really leave us in a time where many people don't know what the future is going to bring or how to play the future when you look at today's world again i'm throwing you a question that i didn't prepare you for at all but when you look at the world uh today and the setup of the economy today and investing today what what comes to mind for you is there always a way to be able to get ahead or do people have to for example start a business to to get ahead can they can they work in an income and do investments on the side and actually beat some of the M2 devaluation we were talking about before we recorded it is where are we in the world? Is, is it possible to still make investments in the traditional approach and get ahead? So when you say the traditional approach, I'm assuming you mean um, like market-based securities. Yeah, that's what that's I mean. Not leveraged in, real, in, single family in, homes. I don't yeah. consider that like a a traditional thing that right. you you talk about real estate really uniquely, but most people don't. So yeah, so and I'm not trying to shit on it. I'm, I'm yeah, genuinely yeah. asking. I'm yeah, like, yeah. what's out there? Yeah. So in 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 actual fact, uh, I mean, maybe it's because I grew up um, f- with a European immigrants owning land and owning real estate. I would consider to be traditional. traditional okay. Right. But I, I understand what you mean from the North American perspective. Um, I think that the wealthy have always seen land ownership and and real estate as a traditional asset. Class. That's fair, sure, for sure. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, the banks would have you possibly think differently in that securities are traditional, but land and buildings and being a landlord were around a lot longer than um, mm-hmm. market traded securities. Mm-hmm. So right. it's just not introduced. I think when I went into the corporate world, you got your RRSP, the corporate Correct. company matched a certain percentage. You Correct. bought some stocks, they matched a- you, exactly. the company stock. And then there was no discussion of using land or maybe some leveraged income properties to, to get ahead. So I can see with your background, how you would think real estate is a traditional exactly. thing. So, so to me, it is a traditional thing. And when you start looking at the, the, what, I believe you're referring to as the traditional um, route of mutual funds. Um, now, uh, for the most part, ETFs have. Um, I just put out a little YouTube short about um, the history. Dude, of you're doing ETFs. YouTube shorts now. Well, you're I'm not. Fan. Dude, I, you're 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 big time. You're on. You're oh yeah, doing social like, media now. I have like 12 subscribers. Do you? Yeah, I'm going to subscribe after this. Count, okay, perfect. Let's count so at 13. 13. Awesome. And yeah, my mom's one of the subscribers. <laughs> your cat, my, your yeah, dog. my dog, and like some. Dude, that's how we started with our email list. We had seven people on our email list. It was like a. Yeah. It was my second Yahoo email account. Our mom, my dad, who never has an email that I made an email some account. bot from like yeah, Southeast totally. Asia, right? <laughs> so who knows? Um, but you know, uh, ETFs have grown in popularity, like literally. And you know that the first one was launched in Canada. I don't know. I thought you were going to say like Vanguard nope, or something. Nope. It was launched in Canada in the 1990s, wow. March 1990, I believe. What was it? Uh, it was uh, the, it's XIU now. Okay. Um, the TSX 60. I believe huh. that's what it tracks. And now we're north of $9 trillion in assets oh under management God. and ETFs. So um, traditionally, I think uh, the traditional approach of going into RSPs and, and so on and so forth was a tradition. Uh, it came from the tradition of defined benefit pension plans, okay, which was a part of uh, the negotiations that unions mm-hmm. made for their workers. So workers would say, listen, I don't have to think about retirement. I don't have to think about financial planning. I'm going to work for this company from the day I 
mm-hmm. graduate from whatever I graduate from until the day I retire. And then that company is inadvertently going to take care of me along with the government through pension programs. Then what happened was- I forgot this history, right? yeah. And then yeah. what happened was you start seeing that these pensions are unsustainable. So I, I don't know if, how much you know about how a defined benefit pension plan works, but- I would say maybe zero out of a hundred. Right, so <laughs> the, the people think I'm paying in, it's invested on my behalf, and then I'm living off the spoils thereafter. These pension plans require um, require a system whereby you're paying in, and what you're paying in sustains a pot that is paying out. I thought you were going to say sustains a Ponzi. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God, I thought that's what you were no, no. It sustains yeah. the Ponzi. Yeah. And the Ponzi so, a pot. Okay. Yeah, so <laughs> it's become, um, as demographics have changed, and we're not having you know three, four children per, per couple anymore, uh, it's become difficult to keep that going. So what happened was they started getting rid of these um, these types of defined benefit pension plans, and you go over to the defined contribution type plans, where it's like, okay, you contribute 5%, company's gonna match it, and then you pick from a, a menu of mutual funds. And they've done this, in my opinion, because it's easier, okay? You don't have to really think about it, okay? It's just easier to do, right? So a mutual fund, an ETF, um, GICs, put it into RSPs, put it into TFSAs, that's much easier. And and it keeps people thinking about getting up in the morning, going to work, getting their kids from school, blah, blah, Mm. blah, blah, blah. blah. Real estate requires a level of sophistication that is over and above buying a mutual fund, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. I've seen, personally seen people uh, achieve don't bullshit me right now a lot of wealth through just fab i was buying everything regular. you were selling me until right now yeah for just regu- with just regular sure uh, yeah, yeah. Regular, regular investing approach. yeah just even just buying gic's right but it's a matter of they saved they saved they saved they paid off their house and they got wealthy mm-hmm. but so live below their means invest in things exactly be prudent yeah kind of boring mm-hmm. right have they achieved extravagant wealth? No. In order to achieve extravagant wealth, you're going to have to take a risk over and above the traditional approach. You're going to need to either get in on some, you know, ground up companies that are going to explode. You're going to need to start your own business and sell it for a lot of money down the road, or you're going to need to buy uh, real estate and land in a pocket that is growing, at, that outpaces inflation or M2 as you, you like to track it, it's going to significantly outpace inflation and apply leverage to it. Those are the only ways that I see you can build wealth from the ground up. Yeah, I agree with you. So where then does real estate fit into a financial plan when you're talking to people? Do you introduce it as a new concept? Is it in everybody's financial plan? How do you, how do you approach it? And you keep saying land too, so I want to I want to get your take on land because right. land to me is a little a different, slightly different game within the realm of what we typically talk about, which are income producing yes. properties. Yep. Um, but where does real estate fit in your thinking and when you discuss this with your clients? So let's take a look first. Um, let's define first real estate from a financial perspective and we'll define financial planning okay so real estate i want you to look at it from the basics right it's an asset class like any other asset class right what is an asset an asset is something that has immediate value based on the perception the likelihood of a future cash flow that's all it is right whether it's stocks bonds, GICs, cash, cryptocurrency, You were going to say Bitcoin and you, yeah. you, that's, you could say it. Land, don't whatever say, it don't is. Don't say cryptocurrencies. It's Bitcoin. <laughs> Bitcoin. Sure. We, that's the only one we, we talk about. Correct. All right. But real estate in the context that you guys are dealing with, right? You have to break it down a little further. What type of asset is it? What type of asset class is it? Primarily it's land. It's a commodity, right? So like any other commodity, there is a limited amount of it, 
right? And the land that we currently use really is, is land on ground or above ground. We're not really digging ditches and building factories or commercial properties underground or, you know, property underground. So there's a limited amount of it, right? And there's theoretically an unlimited amount of people that want it, right? So there's a supply and demand component to it. But what we do is we put some sort of a structure on it that will create a cash flow for us. So you have multiple streams of cash flow, right? You have the rental profits, and then you have the possible appreciation of the land down the road, right? So it's very different from, let's say, a GIC, which has only basically two cash flows, the accrued interest and then the uh, the cash flow at the end, getting the money back. So it's the credit worthiness of the institution that you're putting the money into. You They're promising to pay you a certain amount of interest, right? And you know what the outcome is going to be exactly, right? And the premium you're getting is based on, hey, maybe they might not pay us. With real estate, there's a lot of unknowns, okay? The other thing about real estate that makes it different from a financial planning perspective, I'm going to get to what financial planning is, at least from my perspective. The other thing with real estate is there's a lot of unknowns that you don't see. Okay. So real estate fluctuates in value like any other asset based on supply and demand, based on, you know, whatever macroeconomic factors exist and based on your own microeconomic factors as well. But you don't see, there's no ticker mm-hmm. above it's your house. It's not mark to market daily, so, exactly. which to me is a great thing. <laughs> it, is, it is a good thing from a psychological perspective. Totally. Because right? emotionally, you'll just hit the button and sell it. If you see it go down and a you tenant's bothering it. you on the same you day, it. you're like, sell. You got it. <laughs> but it is fluctuating in value. Sure. Just like anything else. You know, just, you know, we talk about um, a lot about whole life policies and they just go up, 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 and they don't fluctuate on paper. They don't fluctuate, but trust me, there's a portfolio in the background that is fluctuating in value, right? So it's an asset class that fluctuates in value like any other asset class, but psychologically it doesn't because you don't see a ticker, right? You don't see, mm-hmm, you don't mm-hmm. see a mark to market mm-hmm. on every, every minute, right? So how does it fit into your financial plan, right? It's just an asset class. It, that's all it is. Right. And you have to look at it like just an asset class and you have to be able to. Um, I find that one of the biggest problems is people treat it like a religion. Mm-hmm. I believe in real estate or I believe in this, that this isn't a religion. Right. Mm-hmm. Look at it like a fact. Right. Yeah. It's an asset class. I'm going to put my money. I wonder money why people think of it as a religion. It's probably because it's one of the few asset classes because I, I'll, I'll go to the leverage. That like, for example, you put 20% down on a property. If the average appreciation from 1969 to today in Canada is just under 7%, I'll round it up. It, uh, the GTA, sorry, not Canada. I'll round that up to 7%. 7% gain on 20% down payment is 35% return. So I just think that people get maybe religious about it because it's one of the few ways to outpace the debasement or the CPI inflation, however we're going to measure it. Yep. it that the average person... Yeah. can jump into. They're not starting a high tech biotech firm. You know, they're not institutions that are deploying capital in massive ways across multiple countries and geographic areas. So it's like the average person can do this and they'll pay. So I, I, I'm assuming that's where the religious fever of real estate comes from. But you see what you just did? You just use facts to support an argument, right? I like real estate because of A, B, C, D, and E, right? Religion requires you to take a leap of faith, right? So a lot of people that I deal with will come to me, especially rookie real estate Mm -hmm. investors, and they will have adopted um, a religious almost... Yeah, got it. Just get me some real estate. Real estate. Yeah, I believe in real estate. Yeah, yeah, got it. Well, it's not not a religion to believe in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? It's... it's a, pain fact, in the, it's a pain in facts. the ass. No, there's facts that <laughs> yeah. have to be applied to the situation, yeah. right? So let's rewind and say, let's define, we know what real estate is, at least from my perspective. It's a commodity with a re- revenue generating business sitting constructed on top of it that will provide a future cash flow discounted to today, all right? And what you're trying to do is you're trying to underpay for that asset so that you can generate revenue to sustain it 
pay off the mortgage, pay the expenses, have a profit, and then get a larger cash flow at the end, right? So I always tell people, I say, listen, worst case scenario, you put 20% down, break even for the next 25 years, and the property did not go up in value at all, okay? You five extra money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If the property doubled yeah. in value, yeah. you've 10 extra money. Yeah. Yeah, right? hard to argue that simple it's, it's fact. Really, yeah. it's, it's pretty simple. Yeah, okay? a lot of bumps and bruises along the way, but yes. Yeah. 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 The other thing people have to think about is direct investment in real estate does require a little bit of work. So it's kind of like a hybrid between investment and, a biz- and running a business. Yes, yeah, it really is. Okay. Yes. Right. So you should be rewarded more than with a purely passive investment, like a mutual fund or an ETF or just buying a basket of bank stocks mm-hmm. or something like that, okay? Because there is a business. It's almost like a little franchise that you're buying, that your, your franchise is shelter, and there's no big franchise fees to some, you know, not like to Subway or Burger King or McDonald's. Exactly. It's like you're buying a franchise in the realm or niche of shelter, and you're an active business owner. The customers are coming in and living in the business, you can hire a daily manager, your property manager. That would be like, you know, yep. the, the manager at the McDonald's or Burger King if you're buying a franchise. Um, and it, it, yeah, it is this weird thing, hard asset with a business layered on top of it. Exactly. So there's, there's a business component to it. So you should be expecting a better rate of return over the long run than a purely passive investment, right? We'll rewind. What is financial planning? Right, because people... Yeah, tell us, Fab. Tell us, because I shit on it a lot. But you're one of the few people that are in here talk about this that I'll actually listen to. So So (laughs) financial planning is is a concept. um, I'm going to give my opinion, because I'm independent and I can say whatever the hell I want. Um, It's a concept that's been, in Canada at least, dominated by the banks uh, or dominated by large institutions um, as a method mainly to sell their products, which there's nothing wrong with that. They're in the business of selling their products, their financial products. So, you know, you'll come in, you'll get a free financial plan. And the conclusion seems to always be (laughs) by these three diversified mutual funds, whatever the heck it is, right? Whatever it is. But the idea is a financial plan is exactly the same as a business plan. It's, it's the same thing, but for you and your family, Mm -hmm. that's all it is. It's a business plan for you and your family. Money, like it or not, is what's going to drive the quality of your life, right? Mm-hmm. It's going to get your kid into the better school. It, you know, yeah, have some directly. daily peace of mind. It's going to put clothes on, you, on yeah. your back. It's going to put food on the table. Mm-hmm. It's going to put shelter over your, over your head, okay? So money, the inflow and outflow of money is, is very important to the quality of your life and even the extent of your life. Because wealthy people on average live longer than less wealthy people. It's just a fact of life, okay? So the ability to manage your money and to understand it, that's what financial planning is. And it's, in my opinion, a very important a very important thing. And it's not like, I, I, people say, oh, it's not taught in schools, but really what the hell is taught? In <laughs> <laughs> what did you learn oh, in school that, that was yeah. really valuable yeah, after grade think, eight? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, how to hack the system, how to figure out. Yeah, I'll never right. forget one, t- one teacher. It was like uh, my introduction to business class in high school. I figured out that every third question of the chapter review was going to be her test. There you go. So I figured that kind of, so that kind of, you know, that yeah. kind of stuff. You learned how to memorize. <laughs> learned how to memorize. Right? Yeah. So, so, you know, and now we have computers to do that for us. Yeah. And right. AI. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. We can talk about that after too. Um, there goes financial planners. Yeah, gone. Fab, gone. gone. Put Fab in. Hey, listen to Fab. Nice speak. knowing you. Right? Listen to Fab yeah. speak for a hundred hours. Yeah. Then we don't need Fab anymore. Just but you can live on. Yeah, yeah. And your children can profit from your business because there'll be this, you know, this illustration or this what this like AI representation of Fab giving out advice. 30, 40, 100 years from now. Exactly. You're going to have to keep learning. Have you have you planned for that, Fab? I'll be dead by then. I know, but Don't you'll care. still be earning money. Not my problem. <laughs> my kids can worry about it. Go. Sorry, I cut you off. So the financial plan, keep going. So financial planning is really at, at its core. It's, it's like a business plan. You start with your like net worth statement. You start with, okay, where do I stand right now? Okay. Then 
you pick different spots in life, different phases in life, and you say, where do I want to be at each one of those different phases? How do I get there financially? Okay. So the bulk of financial planning, when you look at like social media or or whatnot, the bulk of financial planning is concentrated on what? The investment component, because that's the most exciting. Yeah, to me, component. it's 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 focused on not losing what you already have. Whereas I want to speak to financial planners who are like, hey, like what you just said, here's where I want to be. How am I going to get there? Most yeah. financial planning, from my experience, is okay. Let's try to protect what you already have, and then we'll, you know, it'll kind of sort of maybe grow a little bit as well. Whereas what you're talking about is really looking at your life and mapping some goals to that. Yes, exactly. But the first part of a financial plan when I when I, I'm consulting mm-hmm. for it, right? The first thing I say is, okay, everybody wants to be rich, right? Who doesn't want to be rich? Sure. Let's define rich first. So why don't you define what rich is? For me. Yeah. Time freedom. I want to spend it with my family, friends, and have experiences. Okay. So it's less on the money, but how much time freedom do I have in my life? to work on the things that are meaningful to me, spend my time and days with the people I want to spend them with. I think to me that is right now what I would consider being, I hate the word, but rich. Okay. This is an extremely common response that I get from my Shit, clients. I'm not unique? No. Ah, come on. I'm, I'm sorry. Holy shit. Yeah. Fuck. Well, we're going to make you unique. Okay, okay, got it. I say that's all great, but in a plan, a business plan, right? What do you hate about when people are presenting business plans to you? In general? Yes. Oh, my number one pet peeve on business plans is when they tell me the market is a hundred trillion in size. And if we only capture 2% of it with this business, the business is going to be making millions of dollars. Okay. So how are you going to capture that 2%, right? Exactly. They're just giving you a bunch of qualitative qualitative facts or qualitative opinions, right? I say, let's take that and translate that into money right? You want freedom to spend time with your children, with your family. You want basically time. You want freedom Mm -hmm. and time. Okay. Yeah. I'm like Braveheart. Yeah. You know what the end where he screams freedom? Yeah. yeah, yeah, That's what I want. You want to scream freedom every day. I want to scream freedom every day. Have your coffee. I don't want to get my intestines pulled out at the end. Like he got them pulled out or, you know, if I go down like that at the very end, maybe that's how I go down. That's pretty fighting for Bitcoin or something. Yeah. yeah, Fighting against the central banks. If I go down fighting against the central banks with my intestines being pulled out of me, screaming freedom, I won. Yeah. I'll be happy. But we need to translate that into, into dollars and cents. Okay. And my definition of rich is yeah. it's not okay you're at 10 million bucks you're rich you're at 20 million bucks you're rich it's really based on what you what you're looking for and it, i want to give you the life that you want defined in monetary terms so whatever life you want mm, that's a nice way to say it right yeah. it's you have to have a pot of investments that are going to pay you a certain amount of revenue that will sustain your desired lifestyle Mm -hmm. for as long as you want it to be sustained while at the same time leaving the legacy, financial legacy that you want to leave all based on reasonable projections, okay? So you can't come and say, okay, well, listen, my life, we've defined what you want, just create a budget. I don't wanna work. I want to have complete freedom to do A, B, C, D, and E. And my life is going to cost me today $150,000 a year. Okay. And I think that I'm going to make generate a return on investment of 15% there forever. Therefore, I need a million dollars. Stupid plan, right? Because we're probably not (laughs) going to be able to generate a return, a, a sustainable rate of return of 15% right? So you're going to need to come up with some sort of a plan to get you to that amount of money or that amount of investment or the type of investment that is going to pay you that rate of Mm -hmm. return, giving you the cash flow to live your life the way you want and to leave what you want to leave to your children or whatever, to charity or how receptive are people? So you're breaking it out very thoroughly and competently, I would say. How How receptive are people when you take this approach with them? They like it or is it just too much? No, no, they like it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. They and like it because we, we, def- we start defining, defining what, what you need. Them, right? And when you're defining what you need, 
listen, I'm like the inflation debasement guy. So like to me, I guess you have to take into account inflation and all of this as well. So yes. are you matching the investments that you're about to recommend to people to uh, staying ahead of however you're measuring inflation? Well, inflation is only one part of the equation. Okay, what are the right? others? The, the unfortunate reality is, um, I don't know if you've noticed, but we've known each other for a while, mm -hmm. right? We're not getting any younger. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. So age, Shit. aging mm -hmm. is is also. I'm on the lap back. I'm 50, so Mike Desormo tells me I'm on the lap back. Yeah, you're still on the la you're still going forward. I'm 46, so I'm. I'm no, I'm you got that's a lot of, No, corner, no, that's a long corner, right? <laughs> so <laughs> ultimately, age and and different phases of life. Yeah, got it. Affect your money differently because your desires change. Your your wants and desires change. People will say, you know what? There, a lot of people come to me and they'll want a financial plan in their fifties. That is the typical time when people want a financial plan. A because they can afford it. Got it. Right. Oh, to pay, shit, I'm to, shocked to hear that. Yeah. But got it. Okay. They, they they can afford it. Okay. Right. Because they're not cheap. They're expensive yeah. to do because it requires a lot of time and a lot of. So the people that you are dealing with in their fifties, they've made some money because most people then they've aren't, made money. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. They've made money. I'm not. An, I'm going to go on the record. I am not an expert on taking people out of financial disarray or poverty and bringing them into. Mm -hmm. wealth. I, I am not an expert mm -hmm. on that. I No, from watching you, you're yeah. very good at taking people who have accumulated some asset base and protecting that. And per, I don't want to say leveraging like leveraging, but, you know, sustaining that growth going forward with just yeah. watching you with the professionals around you, with the lawyers who are really good at doing wills that you engage with, where with your, we haven't talked about life insurance in right. deep today, but that kind of stuff, you're very good at crafting a real master plan, which I, I personally appreciate. I think that my, my job is to support people and just stop them from falling off the cliff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that, that's, that's how I look at my, my, you're never going to stop right? people from falling off the cliff. Some you could try, will. you could try. Some yeah. Some people, are. but the, the idea is, I think we were, we'll rewind back to what, mm -hmm. um, where we were, uh, going with all this. The idea is, um, once you know what it is you need, what I've seen from my, my clients mm -hmm. is just relief because they're like, okay, now I know what the destination is. And when you know where the destination is, you're going to get there more efficiently. Okay. So one of my most recent, um, comprehensive, uh, planning clients, they, uh, about, yeah, he, he just turned 50. Okay. And they have, uh, two children, both young adults. One, um, is just graduating university soon will likely be successful. The other one, Great person, actually quite intelligent. <laughs> I like wonderful. the way you're saying that. Yeah. Actually quite intelligent. <laughs> yeah. Um, and works, right? Um, but she, she, the, 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 the child does have Down syndrome. Oh, geez. Okay. But is healthy and is expected to live basically probably until 80. Mm -hmm. Okay. And will require, will require financial support after the death of the parents. Yeah, I've never thought about that. So right. so they're planning now for the financial needs. Yeah, that that I guess that changes your thinking entirely. It completely changes their thinking. So it's difficult to walk into a, a bank and get a free financial plan and address these types of things, mm -hmm. right? So in a situation like this, wealth has to extend far beyond their lifespan. It's not a matter of, I'm going to leave my kids a million bucks each. No, the definition of wealth to these particular individuals is we want to travel. We want to do this, all the normal things of that mm -hmm, yeah. people in their early fifties or late forties are thinking about dreaming about in retirement, but there's a big caveat. It's, we want to make sure that this kid not only survives, but thrives for their entire life mm -hmm. until they pass away. Without, are you going to play that? Yeah, without ignoring, without ignoring the other child yeah. and without putting a huge uh, financial burden on the other child to take care yeah. of their, of their sibling. Yeah, where do you even start with that? That's a huge amount of time. Yeah. So th this, this was, 
That's a complicated months, one. Months in, in, this was a months of work yeah. to get the plan going for them. And their plan, you know, they, they had, they had assets, um, a lot of cash, mm-hmm. uh, some RSPs and whatnot. And the conclusion was actually a combination of traditional, like individual stocks, some ETFs, uh, a rental property, and a, a life insurance policy because they have a corporation. They, they have a corporation, so it made, mm, got it. made sense. Uh, the reason being is that we could time everything out whereby one or two rental properties could be left as a legacy to the child who doesn't have the disability, but a large wad of cash could be left in trust for the child with a disability, right? So when you, when I say, you know, real estate- It's so difficult to plan for because like my mind just goes to inflation, just eating away at the purchasing power of that cash. It will, left it will. That eat, child, eat, eat, and I know you're planning for, yeah, and yes. I know you're planning for that yes. with the other investments, but like- But we're gonna that, drain That it. actually bothers me a lot that- the system, this family saves through their time and labor, saves all this cash, and it just gets eaten away through government spending. And I just feel like they're they're just robbing this family from this purchasing power that should go to this child. Um, it just sucks. I, I hate it. Anyway, lot, I know we're yeah, not yeah, s- yeah, no, hundred percent. And listen, this is the reality of life. A lot of things suck. Yeah, no, agree. Right, we're yeah. gonna have to. And I just like to uh, focus on this one. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I'm not. I'm not going to not, to deny this. But my job. Yeah, you're is, planning around. Yeah, it. yeah, my job is to help them plan around it and to work with what they have. Mm-hmm. Okay, so they want to build wealth. They want to leave generational wealth, but they also want to be able to sustain a lifestyle for the disabled child. Mm-hmm. Okay. So in order to sustain uh, a lifestyle for the disabled child, what's the number one thing we're going to need? We're going to need liquidity because we're going to need to pay for this child on a, on a yeah, monthly basis. So the real estate component is absolutely not going to work to take care of that kid mm-hmm. for the rest of her life. We're going to need something much more liquid. You can't park one rental property in her life for future gains. Not based on not based on the conclusions for this specific family. Okay. okay. Other families, perhaps. Yes. Okay. Other okay. families, perhaps, but they are not wealthy enough to do that. Mm. Yeah, I guess you have to make choices. Shit. Yeah. yeah so yeah. the choice that that, w- hey, that you get into made, a lot of tough yeah. stuff, man. The 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 decision we had to make is we are going to need to tap into the capital. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. It's very difficult to tap into capital with real estate. We can't fractionally sell your Mm -hmm. real estate, Mm -hmm. right? Um, You can borrow against it, but it's not a press a button, borrow against it. You have to reapply for a mortgage and qualify for the mortgage. And then can you write off the interest when you use that, that um, the proceeds of the loan to sustain uh, your your regular life? There's too many factors. So it's much simpler and much more guaranteed to simply do, let's say, a corporate bond ladder or, or you know, some sort of traditional mm-hmm. asset that is liquid and going to pay us, uh, you know, dividends or interest or whatever, so that the child can, um, so that the child can be sustained for Got their it. life. Okay. So I could see what, how much time that kind of financial planning takes. Then, yeah. Right. Yeah. And then, how are we going to get that money? We need that money to be there guaranteed. It has to be guaranteed. So this is where the life insurance component comes into it, a permanent life insurance. We have a need for a certain amount of money guaranteed. We want to tax shelter the growth. So we accept a smaller rate of return for a guaranteed payout at a guaranteed time when they're exactly gonna need it when mom and Because you're paying away. into it and then the latter kind of can pay out every year a set amount? Well, what happens is you're going to pay into it. Yes. It's going to grow at a certain yep. rate, conservative rate, yep. tax-free, mm-hmm. pay out tax-free, and we're going to have the amount of money that we are predicting we are going to need at their death. Yes. Because you predict their, yep. their time of death, which you can do sure. quite yeah. accurately. Yep. 
in order to sustain the child for the rest of their life, mm-hmm. right? And that's the one component of their of their uh, their shit, financial man. plan. Whereas the other child is very entrepreneurial. Hmm. Okay, so I'd like to leave that child generational wealth. I'd like to leave that child properties. Got right? it. And then whatever other liquid assets they have can pay the taxes at death. And then are you engaging? Um, well, I know you've been in here with multiple people in the past. Great yeah. people. Your resources are deep and, and smart. Um, so you're engaging a lawyer to craft the wills to match the financial plan from an estate planning. Person. Yeah. So in this particular case. You will case, refer them to, to one of your guys. Perhaps? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So in this particular case, they'll need multiple wills because they have corporations, corporations. In, on yeah. top of their tr- regular will. Um, and then you know, beneficiary designations on their um, whatever. like. Okay. So you and then you'll engage with their, are you their accountant? Yes. Okay. So you'll manage that component for yes. them, work with them on the financial plan, get a lawyer in for some of the legal parts of all of this. Um, who uh, is there another professional? I guess that's the, that's the majority. It's primarily going to be that's corporate it. lawyer, estate lawyer, accountant. And okay. I manage their money. And then you're saying a state lawyer is separated from a corporate lawyer because they specialize in estate planning. Is that why you're saying some, two some, lawyers? Can do, some do both. But when I say estate lawyer, it's, uh, I, I prefer not to do, to go to someone who does wills haphazardly, yeah. but, um, someone that's spending, you know, 40 to 40% or more of their time on, on wills, wills and estate. And you, yeah. And the reason for that is because a small mistake in some of these wills can be very costly, correct? Yes. It's like, very, it's, it, it could be one of the most costly mistakes you could ever make. Is there an example that comes to mind of that? Sure. Um, a great example would be uh, we have a very, very, very wealthy client. Okay. They're um, in their 70s and they just didn't even have a will or they hadn't had a will updated in maybe 20, 30 years. We did um, an estate freeze for them. Okay. And they told me, Fab, I want to cut my daughter out of the will. What Later first, cuts. what's an estate freeze? Oh, sorry. An estate freeze. They, they own multiple corporations and multiple um, uh, assets. What we do is we freeze the value of while you're estate. doing this planning. Well, yeah, this is the first component of their estate plan, right? They already have a large life insurance policy from before. They would sure. never qualify right now anyways, but they have cash, life insurance, um, multiple properties and a business. So even though they're in their 70s, they're still active in the business and it keeps growing in value. The properties keep going up in sure, value. Especially now at this time, I'm sure yeah. it's just compounding crazy. And they've got like pockets of properties that are right now um, being used in the business that could be sold to a developer. Oh, wow. Got tons it. Tons and tons okay. of money that they bought for, you know, a, a goat and, and a bag of yeah. rice yeah. back in, <laughs> you know, the 50s, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> or whenever it was yeah. that they bought it. Um, so this, these assets continue to grow in value, right? We know that they're at the tail end of their lives, right? So what we do is we freeze the value of all their assets right now and transfer the growth of to a different entity to a trust okay. with the children as beneficiaries of the trust. They wanted to cut the so they can handle all the taxes or, you know, your, your transfer. Well, transfer. no, because this is, this is how you build that generational wealth. You freeze the value. You, you know what your tax bill is when you're yeah. going to die. Yeah. We can plan to pay. All plan. future growth is transferred over to the trust. And then we repeat that on the next generation mm-hmm. and the next generation and mm-hmm. so on and so forth. Right. So you're, you're perpetually deferring tax generation mm-hmm. after generation. You are handing over some of the responsibility of future ta- tax to the next generation in this trust, but that's accepted and okay. Yeah, it's completely yeah, fine. Yeah. Well, they end up with more in their pocket in sure. Anyways, yeah, right? yeah, got it. I just mean, some, it some kids might not even want that. Um, but yeah, in general, no. they would because there's some assets and wealth there, obviously. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So from that particular perspective, um, getting back to your original yep. question of give me an example of estate problems, they're like, I'm cutting the daughter out, mm-hmm. right? I said, okay, look, I'm not the lawyer, right? I'm the, I'm the numbers guy. Like from a numbers perspective, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. From a practicality perspective, I know it matters. Okay. And sat down with the lawyer, did the estate freeze, put the will together, put, and, you know, cleaning up the deed of trust, 
right? When the trust is settled, you write who the beneficiaries are and so on and so forth. And we were able to convince this couple not to cut the daughter out. So listen, you know, in a situation like this, you can make some inter vivos or during your lifetime transfers to the other children, right? There's nothing wrong with gifting. There's no gift tax in Canada, right? Um, however, cutting one of the children out completely, especially that since that child um, also has a grandchild, is going to lead to estate litigation. And the lawyer estimated that the estate... The cost of that is just... Like prohibited. Half a million dollars of estate litigation, oh just in legal fees, right? Yeah. So they're looking at it. They're okay. We're not going to cut her. We're not going to cut her out. We're going to do this, that, and the other enough to like keep everybody satisfied. So there is no estate litigation, but a will can be challenged. An estate can be challenged. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see why people right. need to be talking to you, Fab. Have you ever thought about? Okay, I, and I'm sure you have. I guess how do I want to frame this? Just thinking about these families that need to plan out so far in the future. When I look back on my own adult life, leaving university and kind of looking at the world from coming into the economy through tech, it was very apparent to me that people who had some um, preconceived notions of how things should work missed the impact of technology on the next 20 years. A prime example to that for me would be Amazon. When I was in the early 2000s, I would talk to people about Amazon and Amazon Prime and they were selling more than books and everyone kind of made fun of me. They couldn't believe I got an Amazon Prime membership really early. I must have, looking back, I must have been one of the very first in Canada, like in the first couple thousand because nobody had it and people laughed at me. Um, and now Amazon, everyone's got deliveries kind of showing up at their offices and their houses all the, all the time. And a lot of people missed out on Amazon because they just couldn't understand that things like a couch even would be sold online. They just wouldn't have it. You know, they're like, maybe books, but you're, you're never gonna buy shoes because you have to try them on. You're never gonna buy a couch. In today's world, I see the pattern returning with a natively digital asset called Bitcoin, where there is going to be a monetary unit of account natively in the digital economy. The fiat central banking one to me is not going to translate to a world where more and more is done globally digitally. As a result, you're going to have some monetary value or premium sucked out of the traditional asset base into this digital world. And financial planners to me on mass, not you, because to me, you're always thinking out of the box, are going to miss a lot of this value extraction. And I feel like the old economy is going to be left on life support, just as old retail was left on life support. Old banking to me now is going to be left on life support as a lot of value leaks out into this new world. Some of it's a lot of bullshit, like all that crypto shit to me are just tech companies that are securities that are not being registered properly. Like that's, they're not even, that's not money. That's just tech companies not going through the proper regulatory authorities and raising capital in weird and wonderful ways. But to me, we do have this thing that is Bitcoin that is now growing and many people are dismissing it. And then when I think of financial planning, I'm like, holy shit, here we go again. I'm left in a situation where I'm trying to explain how technology is going to impact the economy. And if you're not thinking about that in your financial planning out 10, 20, 30 years, you're likely going to miss it. So I guess my question to you is when I talked to you about Bitcoin a couple of years ago, you couldn't, you know, nothing was happening, but now there's looks like there's an ETF coming out next year. Um, in, well, there already are uh, in Canada. There already yeah. are, but now when the U when the U S blesses it with its approval, that even changes the financial planning world in Canada. Let's face it: when Fidelity and BlackRock come out and say yes, you should probably allocate a half a percent or one percent of your net worth. Is this going to? Uh, is is this? Now? I'm just curious. Like, will you now start talking about? Bitcoin a little bit in somebody's allocation? How are you thinking? I know this is evolving brand new. What are your latest? Because before I don't even think you could talk. Are you allowed to even talk about it? You are or you're not? So I have to be careful because I, I can't be giving advice. From a regulatory perspective, I, I can't hype up yeah, yeah, an no. asset class that I'm allowed to sell. Really, Got it. And I don't you want you I mean? to hype it. I guess the perspective I'm coming at is like, there's a trend happening. And I just feel like 
listen, in the early 2000s, I saw a trend where everything was going into the cloud. Accounting software was going into the cloud. I was screaming. I went to NetSuite. They sold, they went public for a billion dollars on the New York Stock Exchange. I remember telling my friends who worked at Oracle that this company was going to explode. They couldn't see it. They were in the industry. And I feel like I'm back at that place like, hey, there's this thing that looks like it's getting regulatory blessings. I know Elizabeth Warren in the US right now is kind of after a little bit, but there is this thing that's going to be an ETF shortly, like pay attention to it. And I feel like 10 years are going to go by and people are going to look back on something like Bitcoin, like they did Amazon going, oh yeah, like that took off. I wish I really paid more attention closely. Is there anything that you're, I don't know, I don't want you to hype it up, but is there anything you're paying attention to thinking about when I say all this? I know it's a difficult thing and I'm not framing no, it no, as no, a direct no, no. question. Let me give you my stand. Uh, we'll come back to what I said before. None of this is a religion to me. I don't believe in Bitcoin or disbelieve in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. It's not a God that I need to believe in. I'm looking at all asset classes. And if some sort of an asset class is going to give some sort of a stable or fit into this particular person's financial puzzle and solve this person's financial situation and they can psychologically handle it, and I'm allowed to advise on it, I'm going to consider it 100%, whether it's Bitcoin, an ETF, a piece of real estate, a life insurance policy. To me, it matters not. If Bitcoin or any other similar type of asset class becomes commonplace, you can bet that it's going to be eaten up by institutions and utilized by institutions. I'm not a stock picker per mm -hmm. se, you know, there's people that they're, they're, all their job is to do is to allocate the funds. My job is to take you and your family, understand your psychology and your attitude towards money and build a plan to get there, right? And for some, many of my clients, they have, they have this asset class. And I, I say, listen, if you want that asset class, I'm going to build that into your plan, right? Yeah, that's what's good about you. You're willing to discuss things with with people and have an open mind to it, and which which I appreciate, Fab, because most people aren't going to talk about leverage. Because to me, a combination of leverage real estate is maximizing the old world and some Bitcoin. Even a tiny allocation to it is kind of exposing yourself to a potential new world um, that might have some, you know, rocket fuel behind it. And you have to stay. You have to keep up with emerging technologies, right? Like it's a, it might sound like a crazy analogy, but like why did the why do we think the dinosaurs died out? They were really well adapted to the situation 65 million years ago, but it changed very quickly. And then we came about mammals, right? We were just this little thing scurrying around, but we were able to adapt to the situation. So if you get too comfortable in one asset class or in one situation and the tables become get turned, the world changes very quickly or very rapidly and you're not able to adapt to that new to that new world, everything you said is going to come to fruition. So how do you do so you're in a tough spot then do you do with your clients I guess then two, three, every year, do you do a review? And then after like a five year period, when you see a landscape change greatly, perhaps you have to adjust the entire financial plan. How does that work yeah, in your you're, industry? You're sort of, you're sort of adapting all the time, right? There are certain fundamentals that I think, um, when you look to the past have always worked, right? So if you're going to be in, I don't know, whatever it is, stocks, let's say you want to buy some companies, you know, it, it, if you have the attitude like, look, I'm going to get established companies that are intertwined into the economy and are constantly profitable, you're going to get a certain amount of return from that company. You're probably going to get a dividend and a reasonable rate of return. You expect a reasonable rate of return over the long run, but you're not going to get um, the situation of like Amazon from buying Amazon back, back in the day and then it shoots up like mm -hmm. crazy. Do you see what I'm Yeah, saying? totally. But now a company um, like Amazon or Apple or whatever, these are now massive institutions. Yeah, they're pillars now. Yeah, they're, they're pillars. They're, you know, like, let's call them blue chips. I'm not saying mm -hmm. go out and buy them, but they've become something different from what they were in the past. 
So uh, an asset class like Bitcoin, for example, you know, you get some people that are religious, religious about it <laughs> on both sides, totally on both sides nasty. of the equation. It's people that are religiously believe in it. So they're like, I like, like to think I have some facts it. on my side, Pat. And then there are, are people that are really, they appear publicly to be religiously against it. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, uh, once again, I, I would, I would encourage anyone to just take, take the belief out of this and just look at the facts, look at the asset class and say, does this fit into my plan? Mm -hmm. Because it may not. You know, it's a very thorough, prudent answer, Fab. I wanted you to get emotional and start banging the table. Yeah, but I hear you. No, I hear you. No, I it's, a, it's the right way to think about it. Say that ether is better or whatever. Yeah. Oof. Yeah. Jeez. Never say that to <laughs> me. Um, that's ins that's the biggest insult you can throw my way, Fab. Um, I, I I have a question for you. You you've kind of done a lot. You know, at forty six. Mm -hmm. You, you've kind of been through a whole bunch of life things and you seem to always have this really great temperament about you where anything comes your way, you can handle it. Um, I know some of your family story and, uh, you know, um, how do you, what is your perspective on life? I'm interested because you deal with a lot of people's finances that can be very uh, intense. As I mentioned, some of your personal history has a lot of different intense moments to it. Um, do you have like an operating manual for life that you kind of live by on a daily basis? So for example, my own is, you know, I have these principles, always do the right thing, treat others as you would treat yourself and give 110%. It's like, if I can stick by those three things, although I'm not perfect at it every day, my life's easy. Um, do you have an operating manual for how you view the world or view your life? I, I don't, I haven't like sat down and really like written it down for myself. I think that the biggest thing um, that I've learned over time is, okay, rule number one, you have to understand life is finite. Okay. It, it's finite. You're going to die at some point. So stop complaining. Just get off your ass and do something about it. So if you want something, go for it. That, that's the first thing. You have to realize that, okay? Then number two, really understand what's going to make you happy and understand what your priorities are. And, and it comes down to like uh, the stupidest stuff that I talk about with clients. They're like, yeah, you know, my wife wants to get a dog, so I'm going to, well, we're going to get a dog. I'm like, okay, but dude, do you want a dog? We have a dog. You know, Do you know how much responsibility a dog is. <laughs> yeah. Like, or <laughs> how much money it's going to cost. In the financial plan, my dog, I should actually show you receipts. I'm pretty sure our dog is costing us a million dollars. Yeah. We are on track yeah. to own a million dollar dog. I'm half joking, but I'm actually half not fab if I add everything. I believe it. Eyes. I believe it. But, but there's a lot of things that people, they say, oh, I have to do this. No, you actually don't have to do a lot of the things you think you have to do. So pause and think and reflect on your choices. Understand what truly gives you happiness. That That's another thing, right? So understand- What gives you happiness, Fab? Just solving problems with people. Just solving problems. You get that's satisfaction when I'm, That's that. when I'm the happiest. It's like if someone comes to me with a problem, if I can play a role in helping solve that problem or guiding people that are like, I don't know where to go. And it's like, okay, I know where I'm going. To me, that's from a work perspective, that's what makes me happy. And then spending time with like the people that I want to spend time with. Right. On your daily routine, do you, are you wearing, is that an aura ring? Yeah. Um, what are you up to with the aura ring there? What are you measuring? Why are you sleep. wearing one sleep? Because you, you have trouble with sleep. I thought I had trouble with sleep. This thing's telling me I'm pretty good at How's your deep sleep versus your REM sleep? I would say deep sleep on average, um, an hour to an hour and a half a night. It's not bad. I'm like, I have horrible deep sleep. I'm like 20 minutes. If I get 35, 40 minutes of deep sleep, it, Nick will get three hours. I will get like 20 minutes of deep sleep, but my REM is through the roof. I'll get like three and a half hours of REM. Hey, you're consolidating. Thoughts. I guess my, all my everything going on yeah. in my brain. Well, so you're pretty balanced on deep and REM. I'm, I mean, it's saying I'm getting decent scores. How's your HRV in the morning? Do you track that? It's um, close to 50. 
Oh, I have a brutal HRV. My HRV is very, I know it's relative to everyone. My, like a good one for me will be 24. You know, on average, I'll get like 16, 17. No one can You're believe resting it. resting. Sorry? Night, resting heart rate at night. I think at the HRV, they're re recording it on the Aura Ring about 20 minutes before you wake up. They're going okay. back to that data. So it analyzes when you woke up and they're going back to about 20 minutes before you woke up and taking the reading then okay. to see what your heart rate variability is at. But what's, as, what, what about the resting heart rate? Resting heart rate. I haven't worn my Aura Ring now in about 18 months. I actually forget. It was, I forget. I feel like it was slightly higher, but it was, it was good. It was decent actually. Yeah. How's well, your, how's your resting heart rate? I think it's all right, like mid fifty. So, uh, so you got everything figured out. Why are you wearing the Aura Ring? Well, I, I just got it. Not too oh, long you just ago. got it. So I just want to. I want to get a good. Yeah, that's what I wore a Whoop band way back. I couldn't even get them in Canada. I had a friend bring it to New York. I picked it up in New York and brought it in, and I wore that for a year. That was super insightful. And then the Aura Ring taught me that if I don't stop eating by seven p.m., I will not get a restful sleep. Like if I eat, some people can go eight eight thirty. I need to stop because I'll go to bed after ten. I need three hours of no digestion to get a proper night's sleep. So last night we got home late from Blue Mountain. There was a beautiful veal cutlet left over from the night before. I ate the veal cutlet, had a bit of a fruit smoothie that I made with protein powder and some stuff in it, and uh, I just know I'm ruining my sleep. So that is probably the biggest thing I picked up from alcohol wearing this. for me. Alcohol. If I have if I have a, even one drink, one glass of wine, two glasses of wine, disaster. Sleep, like even if I think I got good sleep, this thing's telling me I I got horrible sleep. Agreed. That's the it's biggest crazy. thing for me. It hasn't really. Still on the weekends, I'm gonna not every uh, not Friday and Saturday, but usually on the weekends, I'm still gonna enjoy a couple of glasses of wine. That's that's to me something I definitely enjoy, but it ruins my sleep. Ruins it. Huh. What? Anything else you picked up yet? From this? Yeah. Um, no, it's just primarily the sleep stuff. I mean, everything else. Like sometimes well, Why I did you think you were getting bad sleep? I just, you know what it is? I, my wife is, she, she just falls asleep at 10. And then I'm like sitting there. Like, <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> I'm more like that. I will fall asleep immediately. Yeah. And, and I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> You're up for another two hours? But yeah. And then, you know, so I was like, I thought, well, you know, she's great at it. Yeah. And, and, you know, back to like my philosophy on life, yeah. you're asking, I, you, you know, want I want facts. to associate myself with people that are better than me mm -hmm. at certain mm -hmm. things. So I thought maybe by through osmosis, I would get better. But I, I, then I wasn't, okay, my body just wants to go to bed a little bit later. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's normal. I mean, I'm amazed at Nick's recovery. Nick's ability to recovery on sleep is just yeah. all, um, amazing. So then are you working out? Do you notice anything? Because I'll notice after going to Radix, if I've lifted heavy, yeah. wow, my recovery the next day, just my nervous system is spent. My HRV's low. Yeah, I'm, you guys work out like a little bit really less hard. hard. Yeah, a little less hard now. Mike and I have both decided, okay, maybe we'll just tone it down a tad. Right, right, right. Um, but I mean, when I work out, I, I haven't noticed a difference. Hmm. Maybe I'm just not working out. But when I work out, I work out. I don't work out a lot, like 25, 30 You're really minutes. fit. You're, I can just tell you're, 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 you're fit. What is it? What's your diet? Have you always just been like this? Or do you eat well? Do you eat certain foods? I mean, uh, okay. So I don't eat breakfast because okay. I'm not hungry. Okay. Not for anything. Um, I try to go light on lunch and then regular dinner. Mm -hmm. Nothing crazy. I would say that maybe I eat if i had to measure it i could estimate maybe 2500 calories a day and you've never um you've never had breakfast no i don't like it huh it just bloats me coffee in the morning black coffee yeah okay. yeah that's it i've never i've never been a breakfast person well, well, the main thing with me is i i monitor i mean it's impossible to really accurately monitor body composition but i will monitor my weight and as soon as I hit um, over 180 pounds in the morning, okay, I start watching my, you know, indulging in desserts and wow, really? Because you clearly don't have a weight problem, things. but you're monitoring that. Yeah, it, it's one of those things. It, you know, it, I even bring it back to like money. It's yeah. like if you start seeing that your credit card, you, know, you take a look at it, what you spent on. It's like okay, I'm spending a little bit too much on this, a little bit too much on that. You need to curb it back because that becomes the new norm, right? Mm -hmm. So if, ah, you know, well, I hit 180, no problem. Then a year goes by, I'm 185, yeah, whatever. Then it's one night, then next thing you know, you're 200 pounds and you're 20 pounds over what you want it to be, 
right? So I just constantly monitor it. Yeah, a 2% right. gain in your eating compounded is 2% Compound. on a higher number. That's what <laughs> just I'm like compact, just like money. <laughs> it's it's the same thing. It's the same thing. So you got to be you got to be on it. And that's like with anything in in life, hmm. right? Whether it's money, your body composition, um or even uh friendships and relationships yeah. with like family members, right? If you allow too many things, okay, here's my boundary. And you allow your boundary to be crossed a little bit. Okay, well, that's your new boundary. Then you allow it to be crossed again. That's your new boundary. And you keep allowing that. Why are you complaining that this person is taking advantage of you? You're the one that allowed someone to cross the boundary. You're very analytical. Right? Yeah, no, it's a smart way to look at it. When you're 92 and you reflect back on Fabio Campanella's life, what do you think your 92 year old self would tell your 46 year old self today? Would your 92 year old self tell you to change anything? Probably be, be nicer to the kids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Too intense with your kids. You're telling I, them to watch their money. Aren't you? Yeah. How old are your kids? They're 11 and almost eight. Right. I, it's just, um, Sometimes I just got to let them be kids, you know, I, I think it may be, maybe it's like, or maybe I won't, maybe I'll be like, look back and be like, yeah, that should have been harder on them. Right. But I, I, I think maybe it'll be, it'll be, don't, don't be so hard on the kids. What will your 92 year old self tell the Fabio Campanella today about money? Stick with, stick with it. Stick with your plan. Yeah. Stick with it. Cause that's what you know. Right. That's what, that's what you know, and and be consistent. Just stay consistent. Why are you tempted to not stick with it sometimes? What well, everybody is. Yeah. Everybody wants to spend. Everybody wants to like nice vacation. Try try crazy crazy different things. But I think it's just like, look, this is my attitude. I I, I want people to chip away at it because this is from anecdotally. Once again, I haven't done any studies here, but um, and when you do when you do look at the the studies using traditional asset classes, stocks, um, indices, you know, stock indices and whatnot, chipping away at it and, and being consistent, not over leveraging yourself and not taking wild bets, usually, uh, you know, on a balance of probabilities will work, right? I, I really appreciate what you offer people, man. We've come across a lot of people over the years who uh, are, you know, do, small elements of what you do. Very few people take a holistic approach and the feedback we get from investors who engage with you. I have no financial relationship with you, by the way, if anyone's listening yeah, to this, yeah. um, we just get incredible feedback. Uh, honestly, like people who go to see you get this comfort. I think you are defining a number for them that they didn't have before or aiming for, like you just described. And we just get incredible, incredible feedback. So I just really want to thank you because to us here at Rockstar, you're one of the people that are not directly part of our, our our business, but we look at as a almost like a partner where someone comes to us and says, hey, I need this type of analysis done in my life. And we're like, perfect. We know the person. So thank you for everything that you're offering people. I think in the community that we get to play in, you are bringing a lot of value. So um, yeah, I really don't know how to, how to uh, say thank you enough. It's, it's really valuable. So you would need to write a book on a lot of the things that you're talking about, especially today. We did not talk, we didn't go deep into estate planning, which I know you can go into with some of the life insurance and some of the scenarios um, that we described, but you are due for a book because in my mind, you occupy the mind space of a person who can look at all the different asset classes and bring a complete picture together. It's, it's a rare skill. Uh, I'm being sincere. Not many people will talk real estate, land, life insurance, entertain my my annoying thoughts sometimes on how you should how you should invest very few people are open minded enough to take that all into account you're due for a book dude i am um i started a larger book like just on the these topics oh, you mentioned that yeah that's yeah. right and then i started the chapter on life insurance and i found that i it turned into it, a book it turned into a book <laughs> so so I, I went off i i put the the bigger book aside and um uh, i decided and and i'm almost on my first draft of that of the life insurance book uh and i decided i'm going to concentrate on that one first because it's a much shorter book and i've never written a book before 
and I don't want to hire someone to ghostwrite it. I actually want to do it myself and like have my own voice in it. So I'm going to, I'm hoping by the time I'm back on here again, I have released it. Yeah, awesome. That's what I'm hoping. And then, so in the meantime, where can people find you? Um, what's the current URL? And can you define who your client would be? So clients would be um, usually people that are, if you want to classify them from mass affluent up or attempting to get there. And they're looking for sort of integrated advice, not just one small, like, oh, I don't need a tax turn or I just want someone to look at my RSPs or something like that. They want that sort of holistic approach to wealth, to wealth advisory, tax and wealth advisory. That's what I'm looking for. That's who's going to get the most out of me for sure. And where, where will people find you? you can find me on campanellagroup.com. Um, just a heads up, we're redoing the site. So it's just a placeholder at the moment. But is there an email address on there they can find? Yeah, info or, at uh, yeah. campanellagroup.com. Okay. Right. Okay. Or yeah, uh, social media. What, what do you know? Your, you don't even know your Instagram handle. What do, do I you? look like? No. Okay. All right. We'll <laughs> track it down. We'll put it in the show notes. <laughs> yeah, Fab, I really, I really appreciate it. Anything else that you wanted to share? That's Re- it. Yeah, really appreciate yeah. this, man. Good luck with the aura ring. Good luck with the sleep. It seems like you got things in order. But, I uh, hope. I know you're going to keep tracking. And yeah, we'll talk to you soon about the book, the life insurance, all of it. Thanks, man. Awesome, appreciate brother. It. Hey, thanks for tuning in. You can find every new episode of the Your Life, Your Term show on all the major streaming platforms. So Spotify, iTunes, Google Play. And if you'd like to get free copies of some of the books that we've put together, like these right here, or some of the reports that we've put together, like these right here, you can find all of those at www.rockstarinnercircle.com. That's www.rockstarinnercircle.com. That's it for now. Until next time, your life, your terms. Your life, your terms.